Let us pray. Gracious, loving God, I thank you for this day and for this gift. I thank you, Lord, for being the vessel that you will speak to us through today. Give us the words and give me the message, your message, that we need to hear in this day and time together. And to you, Father, be the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Hurry up and wait. As I read this passage of scripture, I thought, how fitting. We're always hurrying it up. Hurry up this. Hurry, hurry, hurry. Hurry, why? So we can wait. I know that that's one of the favorite uh, slogans or sayings of the military. I've heard a lot of different people in the military say, we got to hurry up because we got to wait. But the truth is we spend a lot of our times hurrying up so that we wait, can't we? I recently needed a doctor's appointment, and I called the doctor's office, and I said, you know, I, can I see the doctor today? And she said, well, sure. This was about 9.15. We can work you in. Can you be here at, at 10 o'clock? I said, sure, sure. 25 miles, I can be there at 10 o'clock. I was there at 9.50, signed my little thing on the paper, and I was sure I put 9.50. So I, I was before 10 o'clock, and you want to guess when I saw the doctor. I saw the doctor at 1.50 that day. I sat in the waiting room through lunch and a couple of emergencies. But the truth is we do that all the time. We hurry and wait. And I think Selwyn was sharing that this morning as we prepare for service. We're, we're hurrying it up with all the checks and balances. We're, we're hurrying it up. And then we sit down and we're waiting for that countdown when we go live on the air. So we've got that few minutes. And, and we're, but we're always hurrying up to wait always getting ready for something, to be prepared. This whole passage of scripture this morning is speaking to us as the church. Jesus in so many different teachings throughout the gospel has taught us about his second coming, that he's promised us that he's coming again. And this scripture this morning talks to us. We, the church, need to be ready, to need to, to, to be prepared when he comes. You know, it's hard for us. It's very hard for us to wait, isn't it? It's hard for us. To, we're so impatient. And I think a lot of that is because we're so used to instantaneous. We want everything, and we want it now, don't we? We pop it in the microwave. We can bake a potato in a minute or instant pop, maybe in 30 seconds. You know, we want everything now. Instant world. We want that gratification. And it's the same way with our spiritual journey. We want everything. We want that knowledge. We want everything to come. But sometimes we're not as prepared as we think we are. It amazes me that even today with all the modern technology, and I'm speaking of automobiles. I mean, cars talk to you today. They tell you, they tell you when your tires are low, when air pressure. They tell you if you're getting over in the other lane. They tell you you need an oil change. And some cars will even tell you that you're, you need to refuel. You're running low on gas. Have any of you ever run out of gas? Not long ago, we saw someone carrying a gas can, and their car was just a few miles up the road, and it was a modern car. And I'm thinking, how can you get in your car and not look at the gas hand? <laughs> Have any of you ever run out of gas in your car? When our boys were at home, it was a rarity if we ever got in any vehicle that we own that had gas in it. Can y'all <laughs> nod your heads on that? And I'm often wondering how they even got home. It was below empty. You ever been there? And I'm thinking, I don't even have enough gas to get back to the service station or to the, the fill-up place to get gas. And so Cindy has to always follow behind. But we're always, you know, not prepared as we think we would be. And Jesus is talking to us this morning about the church. Are we prepared? You know, we don't like to wait because we get complacent. Now, if it's something fun and entertaining, we might can be ready and we might can stay awake. But how many of you have ever had something? There might be something on a television show, a television show that you just want to watch. Maybe it's a documentary. Maybe it's a football game. You've waited all week. you got all your chores done, and you're sitting in your favorite chair, and you're waiting for it, and it starts, and finally it's on. And what? You don't even know how it ended. Because you've been asleep through the whole thing. And it's so easy to do because we get so stressed out in all of our preparation until we just sort of slumber off. 
we're not as prepared as we think. And some things in life, we prepare for retirement early in life. We prepare for death with our life insurance and all the wills and the things that we make. There's some things that we can prepare for and some things if we mess up on, we can, we can fix, we can readjust. I was in, when I was in school, we had a paper due. It was really a project. I shared this this morning in our other service. And we had about six weeks on this project. You know, it's one of those things, pick out a topic, you get it approved, and you start working on it. You got six weeks, right? I mean, so why do it now? I mean, you've got six weeks. Well, I got to school that morning, and I did. I had worked on my project. And so we get in class, and I'm thinking, everybody's got some kind of paper, some kind of folder. And I said, oh, no, is the project due today? And the friend next to me said, yes, it's due today. And so I thought, I said, well, I've started it. I'm just, I never said that. I started it. I'm just not finished with it. Now, I know we've got a lot of teachers in here, and there's not going to be any sympathy. So I thought I'm going to have to pull a heartstring on this teacher. And I said, oh, miss, and I won't give her a name. I said, I, I've been working on this. And I said, it, the time just got by. And I said, I was thinking we had another week. And I've almost got it done. I, I just need to do a few little things. Y'all heard that story. And I said, would it be all right if I just turn it in tomorrow? I, and I said, I'll have it all finished. And she looked at me and she said, I'm going to give you something. I'm going to do something for you that will help you the rest of your life. And it will help you so that you won't find yourself in a situation like this again. And I'm thinking, wow, that's, you know, give it to me. And she said, no. I will not take your paper tomorrow. The paper was due today. You've had six weeks to do it. You should have gotten it finished. There's no excuse. She said, but I'm going to do this for you. I won't grade your project. You still have to turn it in. And I will give you some extra assignments. Boy, does that sound like a deal? I'm going to give you some extra assignments so that you can pull the grade up from that. You see, some things we can fix. I wasn't happy with it, but she did give me a lesson. I pretty well heeded to that. I tried to put things, you know, before the telephone, the instant, and the calendars and stuff on our cell phones, you had to write things on calendars, you know. I wasn't a calendar person. It was hard for me to do that. Some things we can fix. Some things, if we didn't plan for, we can go back. It's not going to be too late. We can adjust it. We can make it work out. But Jesus says in our parable this morning, a parable is a story where Jesus is teaching us a lesson of life. That's what it's all about. He's saying, I'm telling you this story, and I want you to listen, and I want you to find yourself in this story, and I want you to heed to these instructions. That Jesus has been telling his disciples and, and his followers for over 2,000 years that what? He's going to come again. He's going to come and he's going to claim us and he's going to take us home and we're going to go up and we're going to be in eternity forever and ever. He's been telling us that for 2,000 years. There's been plenty of teachings, even in the Matthew of Gosp in the Gospel of Matthew. The Messiah will return like a fig tree in bloom. Remember that, that parable about that? The Messiah's return will be like the days of Noah. He will come, no one will know. He gave Noah the instructions. The Messiah's return will be like a thief in the night. See, nobody knows. He says, you've got to be prepared. It's sort of like in scouting. That was one of our mottos. Be ready, be prepared. A good scout is always prepared. And you would think something so crucial, something so important in our lives, that we would heed to it and we would be prepared. You see this parable about this wedding. Let me tell you a little bit about this wedding. The wedding in Jesus' day was similar to our weddings today, but different in the sense that a lot of the wedding, the marriages were prearranged. They were pre-planned. There was a betrothal period where the bride and the groom really, in essence, legally were married, but it hadn't been fully consummated through the ceremony. But legally, they would be married. Now, in the weddings today, the bride is the center, Right? The bride has the general focus, but in, in Jesus' day, it was the groom. The groom was the pivotal person in the wedding. Now, the bride was at her house with her bridesmaids, but the groom was at his house, the home that would be their home together, and he was preparing the home 
And once he got the home prepared, he would go, not just himself, but with a band of people, probably the groomsmen and some of the friends and all the family, and they would go over to the home of the bride. And there he would take his bride and the bridesmaids, and they would go back to the home of the groom. We understand, we need to understand in this parable that he's teaching that Christ is the groom. Christ, Christ is the bridegroom. The bride is the church. The oil lamps that we'll discuss in just a minute, the oil lamps are a symbolic of our faith. The oil is olive oil. Olive oil is symbolic of the Holy Spirit. So the bridesmaids have their lamps, they have their oil, they're at the home of the bridesmaids, and they're waiting for the bridegroom to come. Now here's the tricky part. Now at a wedding, we know the day and time, right? In our weddings, we know, we put out those invitations sometimes a year in advance. We know the day and the time, and you better be there. And if you're a part of that wedding party, what? You better be prepared. You know, bridesmaids, you got to have those dresses that you would never, ever wear again anywhere that would cost you more than your entire wardrobe. Nod your head. Y'all been there? And wear those shoes that you just don't like. And then, the guys, you know, we have to rent those tuxedos or those suits, and we have to dress up, and everything is most uncomfortable. For the most important days of our life, you know, we're most uncomfortable in those tight clothes. But you would never dream of going to a wedding unprepared, would you? Bridesmaids, you wouldn't go wearing the wrong shoes, or the groomsmen not wearing your tuxedo, or not having everything. There's a lot of planning that goes into a wedding. And we do a lot of waiting, don't we? I mean, weddings take place way along. There's a lot of premarital counseling before the wedding ever starts. There's a plan. Some people plan their weddings years in advance. And then there's the day of the wedding, and there's so much waiting. There's the bride and the bridesmaids. Got to go what, early in the morning to get their makeup and their hair done. Our daughter-in-law does that, and she starts early, 7 o'clock, 6.30, 7 o'clock, putting on people's makeup and doing their hair. The wedding's going to be at 6 p.m. You go, you got to get ready, you arrive at the church, and there's hours of the photographer, and you got to get the church decorated, and you're waiting for that, and then you got to wait for the families to get there, and there's photos to be taken, and then there's the wedding. It takes about, what, 30 seconds, 60 seconds, 3 minutes of your life. And then you're waiting again, you know, Yes, we're hungry. We've been there early to get a good seat. We're, we're waiting, and we want to go to the reception. You know, and you're outside the reception hall, and they won't let you come in. You know, you want to get in there. You see the buffet, and it's a, you know, it's better than any buffet that you get anywhere else. You know, mom and dad, they, you know, mortgage their home to, to pay it, but it's good. And then you get in there, and then you're waiting on the, this has always puzzled me, we're waiting on the bride and groom to get there. We're waiting. We spend a lot of time waiting. Where's the bride and groom? Well, they're getting those final pictures. They're getting everything, and finally they come. And then they got this beautiful wedding cake. You ever been at a wedding, and you wonder, when are they ever going to cut the cake? You know, you've had your food, and you do a lot of waiting. Then there's that first dance and all the stuff. So it's no surprise that Jesus uses the parable of a wedding because there's a lot of wet waiting. There's a lot of preparation. It doesn't just happen. Now, I've been to some weddings that sort of look like they just happened because I was involved and maybe I wasn't prepared. But we hurry up so we can wait. Many years ago, one of my favorite, and I think I probably shared this story, one of my favorite country groups was the band Alabama. Y'all remember them? Oh, yeah. I think they're still around. But, you know, we lived in that area. That was our hometown. That was our stomping grounds, as people like to say. So there was going to be their first concert, their first outdoor concert, and it was called the June Jam. And it was like 30 minutes from our house. It was in a big cow pasture. Y'all can picture this, what it was sort of like. And it was in the middle of nowhere, bugs and gnats and mosquitoes and it was going to be I think Alabama was going to come on like at 10 o'clock that night so the group of us that was going I said well what time do we need to leave they said oh we need to leave early thinking you know 
One person said six o'clock. I thought, well, I said, that might be a little close, six o'clock. They're going to be on at 10. She said, no, 6 a.m. I said, 6 a.m.? It's not even an hour. <laughs> yeah, but we need to get there because, you know, we got to, you remember the day? We got to get our lounge chairs out and we got to carry our coolers and we got to carry up because you can't park near where you're going and we walk through this path. We need to get there early. I'm thinking, early? I've never been to a concert like that before. But anyway, we go. And we get out there and we drag all of our stuff and they want to sit like right up front. And it's blazing hot, it's June, but in Georgia it's hot in June. And we're out in the pasture and these bug things are everywhere and we're sitting and we sit there all day. It comes a couple of showers, it rains, there's one pretty heavy storm. We're sweaty, we're hot, the porta potties are five miles down at the next farm. And, you know, you got to walk through all these people to get there. And, you know, we got there at 6, and by 10.30, our snacks were gone. I mean, you know, we'd already gone through our snack bags. And by the time Alabama came on, you know, they got all these other wannabe act, uh, performers, you know, and they're good, and they come on, and they sing every song that they've ever memorized. And I'm thinking, I wanted to see the band Alabama. I would have been better to stay home. And we watch, and finally... Alabama gets on stage, and you know what? I didn't even care. I wanted to go home. I was tired, I was nasty, I was sleepy, and above all, I was hungry, and I wanted something to eat. But we stayed home, we stayed, and it went on. But you know, we do that. We hurry up, and we wait. We hurry up so that we think we can be prepared. But Jesus says, the kingdom of heaven it's like the bridesmaids, the ten bridesmaids. Five were prepared and five weren't prepared. They all knew that this wedding was coming. Now let me tell you, the wedding was at night. The weddings were always mostly at night. And it was the responsibility of the bridesmaids and the bride's party to have all the lanterns and the lamps. Now the bridegroom would have a few. They would come from their house and they didn't just walk down the street and knock on the door. They went through the community. They went through the neighborhood. They went through the village. This was a big thing. A wedding. This was, these were some very stressful days. So a wedding was something good. It was a moment that people could get away from their frustrations and their anxieties. And it was a moment everybody could be happy. So the bridegroom leaves his house. Nobody knows when he's coming. They've been at the house all day getting ready. The bridegroom's at his house, and finally he gets the house ready. And he tells the grooms, let's go. I'm ready to go claim my bride. So he marches through the streets. They go to the bridesmaids, the bride's home where the bridesmaids are residing. And see, they will take their lamps, and that's what will shine the light. And remember what I said? The lamps are fade. The oil is the light of Christ, the Spirit of God himself. The groom, the bridegroom is Jesus, Christ himself, and the people represent the church. Now all the bridesmaids, when they got there, they, they got there probably early, and they all, it says, what? It says they all had their lamps. They all took their lamps. Now I had the privilege, I don't know if you've ever seen what one of these lamps would have looked like, but I had the privilege of seeing one of these lamps and the little container of oil that we hear in scripture they're small these oil lamps are very they're smear, very small and petite and the container that the oil goes in is very small it's a very small container and the oil has to be poured in it's not going to last long it's going to take a lot of oil and the container doesn't have a lot of oil the storage container so we know in this wedding party that the ten bridesmaids were there they all had their lanterns now, they've been there all day. You would think they would be ready. You know, Jesus has been saying what? He's going to come back. He's been telling us that for 2,000 years. Paul thought Jesus would return in his day. Many of the disciples did. The early churches, there was a lot of confusion because people had died and, and Jesus hadn't returned. But he said he, no one knows what? The day, the hour, the time that I come. But he says this, what? Be ready. So all the bridesmaids are at the house. But you know, I guess they were just exhausted because they didn't really know when the bride, the groom was coming. So what happened to them? They sort of dozed off. 
I mean, this was after midnight. They was asleep. They, they, they found themselves in a deep slumber. Maybe they had on some soothing music. Maybe Camel was humming outside or something that was pleasing to them. But you see, we find ourselves that way, don't we? Jesus says, I'm coming. You need to be ready. But, you know, there's so much noise in the world today. We wonder, is, is Jesus really coming? Do I, if he's really coming, do I need to cancel my insurance policies? Do I need to quit paying, paying into my pension plan? Do I need to sell our house and give away everything? Do I really need to do that? No, you don't need to do that. For no one knows the day, the time, or the hour that the Son of Man will come again. But he says you need to be ready. You need to be spiritually ready. Now, like I've been telling people for a long time now and preaching this message, you know, things are nice, but they're not what's going to get you into heaven. And here's for one thing I know. I've preached a lot of funerals. You're not taking any of it with you. You know, none of those U-Hauls, none of those storage buildings are going with you. We need this time to prepare to, be our, to get in a state of righteousness in a right relationship with Jesus Christ. But sometimes, with all the confusion, what keeps us from being prepared? What makes us slumber? Well, we get busy with our lives, our, our ambitions, our careers. We get busy with our raising our children. We get busy with our hobbies. There's so many different things. And if that's not enough, then we have something called a television and the internet. And they keep us busy and they divert our attention. And pretty soon we're totally out of focus. And then we have this pandemic with this COVID, and that sort of gets us out of focus. But I'll tell you, COVID should have got us focused. You know, one of the signs is we began to look around. I'm not one of those doomsday people or those that, that knows the day and time because we don't know. But if you look around the world, if you look at all the events that are happening, if you look at all the things in the Middle East, if you look at all the chaos in our own country, it might be a warning sign that we need to be prepared. We might need to be awake. But see, we let that make us fall into a deep sleep because we're so overwhelmed. We're so resigned that Jesus is coming again, but we don't really know, and we just wonder, and we just don't think about it until it's too late. The groomsman side, he's ready. The groom's ready to pick up his bride. He goes out and he tells all the crowd, and let's go. And they're on the way to the bride's house, and, and they're marching through the streets, and everybody's excited, and they're knocking on the door, and, and the bridesmaids were like, oh, I must have dozed off. So they all get up. Can't you just see the hustle in it? They're all running around. They've probably got some service. And the first thing they have to do is get their lamps ready. they got to carry those lamps. People, this is a symbolic thing. they got to carry these lamps. And the first thing they have to do is trim the wicks. Now, one thing I don't know a lot about olden days, but I know on lanterns and lamps, you have to trim that wick. If you don't, you're going to have a smut, smooty, muddy mess, right? It's going to turn black. Everything's going to be soot. So they're trimming their things, and, and they're getting their, let, their, their lanterns ready. And then guess what? Of them are like, oh, you know what? We forgot our oil. Let me tell you, people. People have been coming to church for thousands of years with their lanterns and their lamps without oil. We've been sitting on our pews. We've been reading scripture. We've been singing beautiful hymns singing beautiful cantatas. We've been doing all of these wonderful things, having wonderful Bible studies and all these studies. We've got our lamps, but we don't have any oil. Does that make sense? See, all these bridesmaids were at the bride, these bridesmaids were at the bride's home and they had their lamps. But they realized, oh my gosh. We don't have any oil. See, they're going to need that oil because it only contains a little bit. That's why I told you that story. They've got to light the way all the way to the groom, to the bridegroom's home. And, and so now they're like, well, we don't have any oil. And, and, and what does she say? Then all the virgins woke up in, in chapter 25, verse 7. Then all the virgins woke up, young women, 
woke up and trimmed their lamps, the foolish one said to the wise, give us some of your oil. Our lamps are going out. Now, I used to think this was sort of a petty thing. Why couldn't you, why couldn't you share a little bit of this oil? But we've got to realize this is a parable. Jesus is telling us a story to apply to our lives, to our Christian journey, to our own state of salvation. No, they replied. I mean, would you go to a wedding and say, oh, I left my shoes. Can I, can I borrow your shoes? Well, I did do a wedding once where the bride had to borrow the bridesmaid's shoes because she forgot her own. No, they replied, there may not be enough for both of us and you. You see, they knew their lamps would, would run out and they'd have to use that extra oil. Instead, go to those who sell the oil and buy some for yourself. You see, this is a parable of being prepared. And so they forgot theirs and they're just going to borrow something. Salvation cannot be bought and sold. Salvation is between God and each individual. They all received the invitation to the wedding, but it was up to each of them to be prepared and have what they needed to enter the wedding hall. You see, sometimes I think we've done such a, an injustice to our children, and maybe even to our grandchildren, thinking that we, we provide whatever they need and, and they think all they have to do is ask and, and we'll get it a good mom and daddy. We're going to make it happen, don't we? It doesn't work in the kingdom of God. Salvation is an individual thing. We can't give it to our children. We can't give it to each other. We can't. It's an individual choice that we have to make. The bridesmaids had a choice that they needed to make and they failed. Five of them did so it came time for the wedding and they don't have any oil and they can't borrow any because you can't borrow oil from somebody. And what do they say? Go to the people who sell that. Go somewhere that you can get some oil. And I'm thinking, where are you going to get oil? This is after midnight. Oil is a very, was a very scarce commodity. But somewhere there must have been something open 24-7 because they go. And lo and behold, while they're gone... Looking for something that they should have already had, what? The bridegroom comes. He knocks on the door and the bridesmaids are ready. The wedding has begun. People are excited. The bride and all of her adornment and the bridesmaids with their lamps glowing. They march through the streets. Everybody's cheering. Everybody's happy. It's a wonderful moment. They get to where they're going. They get to the wedding hall, to the place where the groom lives, where it'll be their home. They all go in. Everybody's excited, and they shut the door. This is in here for a reason. So the bridesmaids, the five wise ones, are inside the hall. They had their oil. Everybody's enjoying the party. It was available to everybody. Everybody was invited, but only five prepared for the the invitation. So the five that's getting the well, they got it somewhere. They made their way to the groom's house and they knock on the door. We got it. He's not going to mind. We're a little bit late. We got our oil. Later, the others also came. Lord, Lord, they said, open the door for us. But he replied, truly I tell you, I do not know you. Let me tell you, brothers and sisters in Christ, one thing that we don't want to hear when our time comes and when Jesus comes again, we don't want to hear those words, I don't know you. But he replied, truly, I do not know you. Therefore, keep watch. Let this be a lesson. Therefore, keep watch because you do not know the day or the hour. See, everybody was invited. Only a few were prepared. The door was closed. It was too late. A lot of bad choices we make, we can fix, we can undo. 
a lot of things that we weren't prepared for, we can fix. We can get those things squared out. But our relationship with Jesus Christ is not one of those things. Once he comes to claim us, once the end of time, once Jesus declares that he's coming to claim his church, the door will be closed. And only those who are prepared, only those who have listened and prepared for this day will enter the kingdom of God. Now you can see why this is probably not preached a lot because people don't want to hear this kind of news. People don't want to hear these gloom and doom stories. They want everything to be good and, and, and they want us to tell you how rich you're going to be and how prosperous you're going to be and you're going to be all those things. But you're also going to be not locked out outside the door of Christ when the time comes if we're not prepared. We need to take this parable to heart. We get so caught up in living life until we forget what's important in life. We get so busy in doing church until we forget what church is about. Church is a place to equip us, to fill us, to awaken us. To get us in tune, to remind us. I like to use that word, remind us. What Jesus said, I will come again and I will take you. In my Father's house there are many mansions, many rooms. And I go there, what? To prepare a place for you. For you who were prepared. Now, the world has fooled us sometimes into thinking... Jesus hadn't come in 2,000 years. Don't worry about it today. Let me shatter that belief for you. Eternity comes every day for somebody. That door can be closed at any time, any hour. This parable speaks to us, the church. Not only do we need to be prepared, but we need to prepare our loved ones. We need to prepare our families. We need to prepare our communities. We need to prepare our nation. We need to prepare our world. That's why it's called the good news. To share the good news of Jesus Christ. To show the world that there is an alternative. There is life beyond the election. There's life beyond COVID. We're still God's people. God's not gone anywhere. The promise still stands. I love you. I will come to receive you again, those who are prepared. No one can do it for you. I love that old thing. There's a saying about ABC religion. Already been chewed. Preachers already read it, told you what you need to know, told you what you don't need to do. I'm going to tell you, you're going to choke on it. We live in some anxious times. Who knows what the future holds? But we know what the future with God holds. Are you prepared? Do you have your lamp? Do you have your oil? Are you ready for Christ to come and claim his bride? Let us pray. Gracious and loving God. You shared your teachings with us. Throughout your time, you taught us that you will come. You will return to claim us, to take us home. You will come to those who have accepted you, who follow you in their faith, but more importantly, live that faith. Lord, there's so much noise in our world today that keeps us busy. It causes us to become complacent to the time. Awaken us today, Lord. Let this parable speak to our hearts individually. 
Let us use this day and this time to look at our own lives and our relationship with you. And Lord, we pray this day that you will use us as your church to carry the lamp and to lead others to the oil. Use us to share the good news, to bring hope. Let us carry your light, your torch out into the world. And may they know, the world know that we are yours for the light that we carry and the love that we share. Through your grace and your mercy, prepare us and awaken us. And all of these things, Father, let us hold steadfast to the promise that you will come, that this day and this hour will pass, but that eternity is forever. In Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen. I can still hear that teacher say, I'm going to do you a favor. So today, I hope that we've, through the reading of God's word, that he's done us a favor. That he's going to allow us the time to prepare. And let us use this day to look at our own lives and to accept him as our Lord and Savior. Receive now the benediction. God of grace and mercy, awaken your fire within us. Remove us from our state of complacency and slumber. Move us forth in our faith into action. Let us prepare our hearts and our souls. And let us lead others to you. In the name of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, now and forever.